Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, this Zoom presentation about the May 2019 expedition to Britannic. And I know that there are a lot of people on this uh, conference who are Britannic scholars and Britannic experts, people who studied the ship for a long time. I just want to give you fair warning that we're going to be talking a little bit about the ship and her sinking, but mostly today we're going to be talking about the expedition, the diving portion. And we've divided up the presentation essentially into four parts. The first is going to be an, intro, uh, an overview of planning an expedition like this, talking about the expedition, talking about how all of this work culminated in the expedition to Greece itself. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the ship and give a, a kind of a 10,000 foot view of the sinking of Britannic. Uh, we're going to see some amazing photographs uh, of the ship as she lays today at the bottom of the Kia Channel. And then last, but certainly, certainly not least, we're going to show you a video of uh, footage from Britannic as well as the, the bell for the first time. So it'll be the first time we've uh, shown a video of the bell that was uh, discovered on the 2019 expedition. It'll be the first time you'll be able to see that underwater. So um, we hope that you enjoy this and please uh, comment and ask comments and questions in the chat and we'll get to them as we go. So to start things off, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Roberts, who was our expedition leader. And it is really thanks to Scott's leadership, vision, extraordinary attention to detail, and just tremendous, tremendous amount of work that any of this was possible. And in my book, he's the best expedition leader ever. So I'm going to turn it over to so the glorious Scott Roberts. Thank you so much. You're too kind, Jen, too kind. Right. I'm going to, first of all, just try and attempt to share my screen. Cool. Right. Excellent. We're off. We had some problems practicing the other day, so I just wanted to be sure. Um, so thank you, everybody, for, for coming and listening. It's really nice to see that there are, um, you know, so many people around the world that are that, that are interested. I'm, I'm aware that, that um, that actually we've got a lot of non-divers as well as divers. So even though very roughly I'm going to be talking about the, the, the planning of the expedition and the, the build-up to the expedition, um, uh, hopefully you'll find that most of it is, is non-diving specific. So you, you're not going to need any real previous knowledge of diving to at least appreciate some of the things that I'm talking about. <clears throat> so, um, back in 1997, I was a fresh-faced uh, tri-mix diver, having done my mixed gas, open circuit mixed gas qualifications a year earlier, um, with, uh, at the same time as George McClure, actually, who was, who was also on the expedition. Um, and just a, just a year later, um, Kevin Gurr organised the, the, the first diving trip to Britannic since um, Cousteau had done his in in the sort of, I think it was 76 or 77. So other than Bob Ballard having gone with submersibles, nobody had really gone for such a long period of time uh, to, try and, to try and dive the wreck that it, it really hit, I think not only the, um, not only the dive media in, um, in UK and I'm sure around the world, but, but actually mainstream made media as well. It was, a, it was a big thing. And having just done my mixed gas qualifications, it immediately went right up to the top of my, of my wish list of wrecks that I, that I wanted to go and do. But unfortunately, you know, back then I was a, a student. I had no cash. I certainly didn't have the experience to even think about going and, and, and diving to those depths. But not only that, the ability to get out there and do, to run an expedition out there was, was a lot harder than, than it is today. Um, so fast forward, frighteningly, nearly 20 years. Um, I was on an expedition with a few of the people that are, are listening um, uh, today and a few of the people that were on the expedition. And um, we were on a trip, we were diving um, off Orkney Isles. So the Orkney Isles are a, a group of islands just off the north coast of Scotland. And we'd had a week, we'd gone as far as 90 miles west of, of Orkney and about 40 miles north of Harris. We'd had absolutely exceptional weather. We'd dived some wrecks, um, well, at least one wreck that nobody had ever dived before. It was amazing. We finished the expedition. We got back to Stromness. We got into the Ferry Inn, which is the, the in the picture, is the pub in the picture. We drank some of those 
very whiskies that you can see there and was reminiscing over the week and what an excellent trip it had been and then talking about what we were going to do um for our you know next what comes next what do we do and um and i i just piped up with why don't we go and dive britannic and of course everybody in the now semi-drunken state thought this was an absolutely fantastic idea everybody immediately signed up to go and to do the trip um and then we drank a load more beer so oh so um about a week later i i got a uh, an email from one of the guys that had been on this trip to say um uh, to say so what, what dates are we targeting for britannic then and i thought oh my heart sank a little bit and i thought i can't believe that actually i'm going to be held to doing this but sure enough everybody's like no you said you were going to organize a trip to um to dive britannic um so then in january uh, 2017, I, um, I, I contacted Simon Mills. Simon's the, the owner of um, Britannic. Um, I, I wrote him a, a, a nice sort of begging letter, really, asking him if he would give us permission to, um, to dive his wreck. And he did tentatively, you know, he said he wanted to know a little bit more information about what we were doing, what we were planning on doing, etc. Um, but also gave me um, some contact details for, um, for Kia divers. Um, so Kia is the island that is just sort of south of, of Greece and um, Britannic sank in the Kia channel only a couple of miles away from there. Um, and Kia divers have a dive operation there and they, they have supported a number of different expeditions to, um, to dive uh, Britannic. And, it, and actually it, it makes it a lot more feasible to, to put an expedition on now. Whereas if you go back, I think, you know, 10, 15 years earlier, um, there wasn't really any support out there. So, you know, the expedition would have been a lot harder. February 2019, we were, we were granted a permit and, and actually the, the, the permit application process is, is an absolute nightmare. Very fortunately for us, um, Janice from Kia Divers did most of, uh, well, pretty much all the legwork for us, attended meetings, et cetera. Um, but of course, by, by the time we got to February, um, February 2019, we were already completely committed to running the expedition. Um, so we were waiting with bated breath to see whether or not our permit was actually going to be granted or not. And then in May 2019, the expedition started. Um, so it was a full, it was more than two years. Um, it was pretty, basically it was two years since the first time I spoke to Kia divers that it took to get the expedition off the ground. And so this was the dive team, um, and, and we are there sat on our veranda overlooking um, the Kia channel. Um, and I think, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but just off this way and off to the right, about two miles over there, that's where Britannic is. Um, so just to very quickly go through, you've got me, uh, we've got George McClure, who I've known since university days. Um, Luke, uh, George is from Northern Ireland. Luke, we've got from the south of England. We've got Joe and Jen, who you'll have heard from earlier, both uh, diving off the eastern seaboard in the US, doing some absolutely amazing diving. Hopefully I'll be joining them later uh, this year. And um, Scott Wyatt um, joined us from Australia. Scott's doing, again, doing some absolutely stunning diving, really hoping in the next couple of years I'm going to be able to get out there and do some stuff with him. Um, we've got Steve Pryor, the token Welshman, uh, the joker of the pack, and um, fortunately, I think Jen's effectively muted him. Um, and then we've got Duncan. Duncan's from Scotland, and um, he was one of the originals on the on the trip that uh, we in the ferry in. Um, just to the front here, we've got the youngest, uh, just a pup member of the group, uh, Rick Simon, a uh, commercial diver, uh, also from the US. Uh, Jacob up at the back, and um, Jacob's uh, uh, living down in London. In fact, poor old Jacob is still recovering from having COVID-19, so all our best to you. Um, and then finally, uh, but not least, uh, we have Rick on the end. Uh, Rick Ayrton. Rick Ayrton is our amazing photographer. And if you ever go and do an expedition like this, you need your very own Rick Ayrton um, so that you've got some great memories to carry forward to from your latter years when, you, when your memory is failing you. And uh, Rick's going to be showing you some of those photos um, uh, shortly. But in order to put 10 divers onto um, Britannic, um, you know, the crew is quite a lot bigger than that again. So this isn't quite the whole team. So I think there were 19, 10 divers and, and nine support. Um, as I've already said, we had Kia divers involved. We were so lucky. Um, just in the centre here, the big guy with the beard, George van der Ross, um, 
he, he's a, a well-known diver in in Greece um, and does a lot of cave exploration. Um, and we were um, we were so lucky to have him as our chief support diver, a consummate professional, um, uh, somebody who 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 had uh, you know. A, whose opinions were so valuable in terms of um, just tweaking the little bits that we needed to te- tweak. And Giannis next to him, Giannis is the owner of um, owner of Kia Divers. But in addition to that, as part of the permit process, um, we had to have a uh, an archaeologist. So we applied to the, get the permit from the efforts of marine antiquities um, in Athens. And as part of that, we, we have to pay for a an archaeologist. And, and I think essentially, as far as I can tell, the archaeologist's job is to sit uh, on the boat and just make sure when we come up out of the water that we're not bringing any art, any artifacts um, off the off the wreck itself. Um, also, as part of that, we needed to have an ROV and an ROV operator. Um, the ROV didn't get wet, uh, and in fact, we were actually told afterwards that the ROV isn't really capable of of, of, of diving down to Britannic and doing anything particularly sensible anyway. Um, but but nevertheless, the ROV operator uh, was was such a great guy, such a great guy. Um, so that was the team. Um, so when we're putting on something uh, something like this. Um, the first thing that, that I always want to look at is um, is risk assessments. Very boring, very dull, um, but but ultimately it's the starting point. And and for me, this the, this expedition represented um, the the deepest and longest duration trip that I've been on. So it was slightly it was well it was pushing my comfort zone a little bit. So I was desperate to make sure that we got everything absolutely absolutely right. As a result of the uh, risk assessments, I just sit then, sit right, um, the diving procedures down, and then get everybody on the on the trips feedback about um, about the plan. And also, we we also approached um, a, a guy, uh, Mark Elliott, um, who is, uh, for those of you who know, is a um, very experienced diver who regularly dives way, way in excess of 120 meters. So it was really great that he was be able to he was able to cast his eyes over um, uh, the procedures we'd written and came back with some really, really useful feedback. Um, but at the end of the day, once the um, procedures are done, then the way that the way that I run it is that everybody buys into it. You get your chance to have some input into the diving procedures, but but they are agreed to by everybody before you get out to Greece. Before you you get out, you don't want any discussion about um, how we're doing things when we're, when you're out there. There is a caveat to that, of course. Um, uh, the daily post um, post dive debriefs did include a lessons learned section where we would see is there anything we could do better now for, for the things that were just tweaks we would make a note of those um, and keep them for any uh, any subsequent expeditions rather than changing the way that we were diving at the time um, but if there's something that does need changing then it, you only really if it really does need changing then you won't um, then you change it um, yeah so that just says that really change the procedures only if you really have to um, so quite a simple organisational structure. Um, I was the ex- expedition lead. Um, Steve Pryor, I managed to palm off um, uh, the transportation to. Um, we had had a guy who uh, unfortunately had to drop out relatively late on who'd been the diving officer and I ended up taking that responsibility on as well. I wouldn't do it again. It, it was It was okay when we were in the swing. Uh, the swing of the trip, but um, the first couple of days were um, probably just, there was probably a bit too much going on really for, for one person to deal with. Um, having, um, again, Kia divers just make, made everything so much easier um, to have that, not only a support crew there, because we would have all, always had a support crew, but had a support crew who had supported that very wreck before and to have all the experience and expertise of, of diving in the Kia channel. Um, and then we had a dive marshal. We had Jen who was uh, who was not diving but was able to uh, log all the things that needed logging as people came out of the water. And actually generally just to make sure we all kept in line and uh, we were all in the right place at the right time and that sort of thing, uh, feeding us with lunch etc. Um, and we had a daily dive marshal who would um, uh, do things like check all the equipment for uh, the shot line. So the extra cylinders that we would need to put on the shot line in case of an emergency. And then we had a drop lines as well with more cylinders on they needed checking. Um, so 
doing the warm up dives are um you know to go you wouldn't go and just jump in and do a 120 meter dive so um you need to be able to build up to this and, and actually what hadn't massively crossed our minds was that um the uh, we choose we chosen to do the expedition in may so there's there's two weather windows there's a weather window in may and then there's a weather window in in late september um and i think i don't really remember the reasons for choosing may but it, for, for whatever they were may suited us better but as we started to get closer of course we realized that you know we've got to warm up um for the for the expedition um but we're trying to warm up when the weather is is, is bad or unpredictable so had we have run the trip in september we wouldn't have needed to do any warm-up diving because we'd have been diving all summer and we would have been um, well prepared for it um so as a result of that there was quite a lot of using um, quarries in UK. These, these these are some of Rick's pictures. Um, we did, the seven of us in UK did manage to um, get together um, to, <clears throat> excuse me, we managed to get together for a weekend at, um, at NDAC, which is a, uh, a quarry that goes down to about 80 metres. Um, so we got a couple of dives in there and then separately we did a lot of, a lot of stuff, um, a lot of stuff separately. Um, I and a few of the guys chose to do some some nice and warm warm up dives, and we went out to Egypt and uh, did some fantastic stuff out there. There's Thomas Canyon on there and um, Gulf Fleet for for those that know that were uh, yeah excellent dives. And logistics, so it, it's, it, there's no mean feat getting the equipment out there. I think when we first started, we um, expected or I expected that I was going to. Uh, phone up a freight forwarder and uh, leave it in their hands they'd give us a quote we'd take that quote up and we just freight forward everything out there um both steve and i quickly realized that um and that, that wasn't really a, a possibility simply because i think most of the freight forwarders what they really wanted was to be dealing with businesses rather than individuals they wanted to work with businesses that were going to give lots and lots of business in in, in their direction so as a result, they would give us a quote, but they were stupid quotes. And then the, the, there was a huge amount of time lost because then we were looking at, well, it's easy, we'll hire a van. Um, but we did an estimate, and you can see the, the very loose estimate that we did here, and we nominally came up with 1.2 tonnes of equipment that we needed to take out. Um, but then you start to look in, you, you start to some of the rental uh, van companies and only about there's only a fraction of rental van companies will actually rent you a van to go out to one of the greek islands and of those not one of them can tell you what type of van that they're actually going to give you so we wanted to take 1.2 tons but we could have got a van that only had a payload of 0.9 tons or it might have just done or it might not anyway in the end we we persuaded steve that we were going to um we were going to batter his van across um, across europe and overload it with all our equipment and um and under duress, he said yes. <laughs> uh, so Steve's journey started um, uh, started all the way up somewhere outside of Aberdeen, um, and um, and actually this blue line doesn't do very much justice because this is what I did on Google Maps. But but um, he sort of zigzagged his way all the way down the UK, picking up everybody's equipment along the way, um, and um, and then put it onto uh, onto the tunnel, onto the Eurotunnel. Um, passed all the way through to um, all the way through Europe to Venice. Picked up another ferry in Venice. Um, took 33 hours all the way down the Adriatic, past the heel of uh, Italy, um, and then to Patras. And then from Patras, he actually uh, met us in Athens. And then um, from Athens, we we went to we went to Kia. But just another sort of level of detail of of, of issue is you you know you're trying to get. Um, or you, you're hoping to get cylinders out there and actually it was much better for us to take cylinders that were full but of course you're then trying to work out well will Eurotunnel let you will this ferry company let you will the other ferry company let you um so there was a lot of a lot of issues in the detail but we finally got out there to um uh to kia divers um and um, this is their this is their shop um, which is is fantastically positioned because it's only about two minute walk down to where the boat was and in the opposite direction is about two minutes away to the uh, to the beautiful accommodation that we had um, so we had a day there um, a, a full day setting up and it did take us a full day I think we, we got down to the uh, we got down to the yard about nine o'clock on the on the Saturday morning of setup day 
And I think we finished sometime after 11 o'clock that night. Um, so it just gives you some sort of idea of, you know, of building everything up um, because it wasn't just our personal equipment. We had lots of cylinders for stages. We had to make drop lines, um, et cetera, making sure um, ascenders were working, uh, you know, and, and, that, and that's before you actually get onto your own personal equipment. Um, and so we got a chance just to go and do a quick shore dive uh, in the local bay to make sure that our rebreathers were still in still in one piece, having been battered around the back of Steve's van all the way across Europe, um, you know, and just to make sure that everything uh, was still working. And so this was our this was our calendar of events. So we arrived on the 9th in Athens, took the ferry across to Kia on the, the following day, the following afternoon, set up on the Saturday. Um, and then we were straight into diving. Birdie Gala was our warm up dive, and I'll very briefly talk about that in a second. Um, and then into um, two Britannic dives. Um, and then we were just running a, um, a break day, uh, two dives and a break day, uh, and so on and so forth. But as you can see, what we sort of did there is that we, you know, that right at the beginning when we were fresh, we had three dives albeit Berdigal is much shallower. Um, then we had two Britannic dives, then we had one Britannic dive in a Berdigal, and then finally, you know, when we're sort of pushing things a little bit, I think we were, you know, a break day, and then just that last Britannic dive. And so what was our, what was our sort of general um, daily routine? So we were, um, we were up um, and down uh, to the yard before eight. Um, it's a check of the, um, all the equipment, the emergency equipment for the, for the shot lines and the drop lines. Um, we have a dive brief at eight o'clock. The dive brief is a really, really quick, essentially has anything changed since yesterday. Um, and then we're loading the boat and ropes at 8.30. Um, the, the Britannic is only about two miles away from uh, where we launched the boat, um, so you're you're not lying out to the dive site, which is uh, which is quite nice. Um, and then we were getting back in again about mid afternoon, have a late lunch, um, and then prep the kit for the next day. So the the, the rule was really that you, we didn't leave until the kit was at a level of um, prepared that would mean that you could be jumping in the water with 10 minutes notice. Um, what we didn't want to do, what we didn't want anybody to do is start slowing everybody down the next day because they, they hadn't got their equipment together the previous day. Um, and then again, the equipment's checked um, for the shot line and the drop line because, of course, it's, since the last time it's been checked, it's bounced out to Britannic and come back again. Um, and, and indeed, some of it's been in the water as well. Um, so we need to make sure we've not lost any gas, et cetera, and um, valves are working, et cetera, et cetera. And then the post, the post dive brief was the um, was the longer brief where we would sit and just look and, and um, see how everything had gone. Um, talked about order of diving for the following day, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then eat, sleep, repeat. So I'd mentioned um, briefly um, Birdie Gala. I've put a picture in here. I don't, don't think anybody else will have done this, this coming up. Um, she's a, a beautiful liner in, in, her, in her own right um, and, and actually was, was sunk by a mine uh, just a week before Britannic was. Um, but she's, she's sat in, in about 70 metres, just shallower of seven, 70 metres of water. Um, she's completely upright. Obviously, the funnels have gone. Top of the deck is about 55 metres. So and, and it's and it's still a big wreck. It's not as big as Britannic, but it's still a big wreck. I mean, it's it's amazing. You you could happily go out and do a ten day trip just on Verdigala. Um, she's got two bells that's still there, um, uh, loads of telegraphs, etc. It's absolutely amazing dive. Um, but what was important for us is that this was the the first and only dive that we would get completely together, all ten of us, and the first one that we had with all of our support crew. So. It was important that we that we got this right. If we if if we hadn't have gone through the procedures correctly, if something hadn't quite worked, we would have had to have come back the next day and dive Verdigala again and make sure everything was right before moving on to onto Britannic. And um, so this is a screenshot of my of the dives that I did um, uh, on Britannic, and um, I've highlighted just one, which is sort of quite a good example. Um, I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, but. Um, just to sort of highlight here, this, this was actually on the stern section. Now, it, she's laying on the side in about 85 metres of water. 
Um, and this point um, here that's highlighted where I've taken a screenshot, that's just before I left the bottom. So um, we were 40 minutes um, before leaving the bottom. Um, so we were, you know, if you say it's taken about, let's say, five minutes to get down, we were getting 35 minutes on the rack. Um, which is which is amazing actually. So you know it's a great amount of time considering that you know you've got a max depth of about 120 meters. I mean obviously on that I've not touched that. I'm not sure does it say what my max depth was. Oh yeah, my max depth on that was 115, 115 meters. Um, but it's a long dive. It's 255 minutes, so you're four and a quarter, four and a quarter hours. Um, in total, I mean, this was. Uh, I think the dives that I did was very typical of everybody on the on the on the trip. Um, and over the eight dives that we did, so that's including two on Berdigala, um, I did 28 hours in water. So that's a that's a hell of a lot of in water time over over a period of of 11 days. But very 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 well worth it. Right, I, that that's me done. I shall hand you over to to Jen, I believe. Yes. Thanks, Scott. I'm actually going to have uh, Rick share his screen. We're having a little bit of a, a delay over here. So Rick is going to okay. run it from Rick. Uh, Simon's going to run our presentation okay. from his computer. Violet Jessup was serving as a nurse aboard the British hospital ship Britannic. And uh, on the morning that Britannic was, was, sank, she had gotten up, she was going about her ordinary routine when something stopped her in her tracks. Suddenly, there was a dull and deafening roar, she remembered. Britannic gave a shiver, a long drawn out shudder from stem to stern, shaking the crockery on the tables, breaking things till it subsided as she slowly continued on her way. We all knew she had been struck. At the time, Britannic was uh, one of the largest passenger ships in the world. She was launched in February 1914. She was uh, of a line of three ships, the Olympic line of the White Star uh, Company, Titanic, Olympic, and Britannic. So she is loosely known as Titanic's sister ship, actually Titanic and Olympics. Uh, she was 50,000 tons. She was the third to be built in the trio. She was almost 900 feet long. Uh, the height of the ship from the top of her funnels to her keel was 175 feet. She had a carrying capacity of 3,300 passengers, and she traveled at a top speed, a speed of 21 knots. She was built by a very famous shipyard in Belfast, uh, Harlan and Wolf, and her keel was laid in 1911. But in 1912, Titanic um, obviously sank, and it was a disastrous sinking. And really, the sinking was, uh, engineers thought, was caused by the fact that there were too few bulkheads and too few lifeboats. So the building of Britannic took a little bit longer because they had to redesign the number of bulkheads, the height of the bulkheads. They, they added some structural improvements, added lifeboats, um, and obviously, uh, better launching capabilities for lifeboats and, and, uh, um, and other such uh, safety type um, uh, things that, that they implemented. And that's the bulkhead on the left and some of the lifeboats being loaded on on the right. And you can go to the next slide. So here they are, the three. Uh, as you can see, Olympic was uh, had some weird painting pattern on it. Uh, Titanic was, um, I believe, built first, then Olympic, then Britannic, or at least launched in, in that order. Here they are again. Here she is. This is Britannic in dry dock, soon to be launched. Um, as you can see how, how massive she is. You can go ahead, Rick, for the next, to the next slide. On the day of the launch, you see a, a bunch of dignitaries and, and people standing uh, near the stern there. You see the fantail tower over them. And on the right side here, on the, this is the bow picture in, the, in dry dock sliding out to the water. And here she is, right as she was launched, as you can see, the funnels are not there yet. And obviously there's a lot of things that aren't 
on the ship yet those things are added on when she's in the water it's one of her boilers that's a funnel that's a funnel mm -hmm. oh <laughs> thanks sorry <laughs> This is, a, uh, this is a painting uh, of her when she was uh, basically commandeered to be a, a hospital ship uh, by the British Navy to serve in World War I. She had four funnels, as you can see, and her official uh, launch date was February 2000, uh, sorry, 1914, um, right at the beginning of World War I, and she really had no um, no other service, no commercial service. She was always in military service as a hospital ship, and she served um, in the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, you know, during the uh, the you know during at the war fronts in the uh, near the Med near Greece and, and and Turkey and such. And although she was a hospital ship, uh, everybody really still recognized how beautiful she was. Uh, the ship surgeon who had served on other hospital ships uh, uh, commented that she was the most wonderful hospital ship that he had ever seen. Because even when converted to that hospital ship uh, shape and style, she was really still a beautiful, beautiful ship. The, she underwent a second modification during her service as a hospital ship. The first class dining room was converting, uh, converted into an operating theater. Public rooms in the upper floors turn into wards for wounded soldiers. As you can saw, as you as as you saw from the uh, the painting of her, she had that green band uh, that ran around the ship with the uh, red cross. Um, she was a spectacular sight when she was um, steaming throughout the Mediterranean. She was in the command of uh, Captain Charlie Bartlett. He was a an accomplished merchant seaman and a Royal Navy Reserve officer. He had commanded big ships before her as well. He had overseen the delivery of Titanic and had um, quite a bit of input uh, and part in the discussions about modifying Olympic and Britannic after the uh, Titanic tragedy. So Britannic made five voyages. And as, a, as, we, as I indicated before, she spent most of her time um, as a floating hospital ship uh, between the area and you know, kind of north um, northeastern, uh, northeast Greece, there in Turkey, coming down into the Mediterranean uh, in the Kia Channel and sailing out um, uh, into the Mediterranean further west. Uh, on her sixth voyage, um, she ran out of luck as she passed Kia Island. She was a victim to a mine laid by U 73. Uh, that mine was was also that U-boat also laid the same mine that uh, Bertigala hit, um, and on November 21, 1916, Britannic was carrying almost 1,100 crew and hospital personnel when she struck that mine. There were um, there were no wounded on board because they were on their way back to pick up wounded soldiers. And that's U-73. And that's U-73 right there. As I read from Violet Jessup earlier, when the ship was struck, everyone knew that Britannic had been hit. And most assumed at the time that it was a torpedo, although later it was confirmed that it was a mine that struck the ship. The emergency, the bell sounded uh, emergency quarters from, for everyone on board. And the, the blast uh, that hit the ship flooded Britannic's watertight compartments. Uh, Ca Captain Bartlett was on the bridge at the time of the explosion. They were really close. They were so close that he could see land. So he ordered the ship to steam towards land, thinking that he might be able to outrun the damage. Britannic's massive propellers were really doing their best to turn at full speed. This is, these are actually Titanic's propellers, not Britannic's. I couldn't find a, a really great picture of Britannic's propellers. So um, the sister ship here will have to stand in. Um, her, her six water, watertight uh, compartments filled with water quickly. And we can talk a lot, and, and like I said, this isn't a technical presentation about the sinking of Britannic, and we can talk a lot about exactly how that happened and how the compartments filled, and even some difficulty closing one of the bulkhead doors. But because we have a lot of people on the call who are not really 
um, into that much of the specifics of the sinking of Britannic. Suffice it to say, the flooding of the watertight compartments very quickly was one of the causes of her sinking. Um, another is her portholes, that her portholes were open. Earlier in the day, some of the nurses had decided to ventilate the sick, uh, the sick ward by opening the portholes in the lower deck, although that was something that Captain Bartlett did, did really not want to happen, but they did it anyway. And he was unaware that the portholes were open. Water started to come in through the portholes as well, which hastened the ship's sinking. Um, and it was listing faster than Captain Bartlett had anticipated. Another thing that the captain didn't anticipate was the premature launching of lifeboats. There were some on the crew that launched the lifeboats using an automatic release mechanism. And they floated on these boats in the water near the ship. The list caused the rotating propellers to rise out of the water and the suction started drawing those couple of lifeboats that were in the water into the enormous propellers. And this is just showing you one of the propeller shafts for Britannic. Violet Jessup was in lifeboat number three and watched as her shipmates and their boats were shredded by Britannic's enormous propellers. She described the condition of the water as one ghastly whirl. And um, despite the want, she was being lowered in lifeboat number three as some people were getting turned into these propellers. And as her boat was lowered into the water, she was nervous. She wasn't really paying attention to what was going on behind her. And then she has the realization of what happened. And she said, all of the sudden, every man in the group of surrounding boats took a flying leap into the sea. They came thudding from behind and all around me, taking to the water like a vast army of rats. I turned around to see the reason for this exodus and in my horror saw Britannic's huge propeller churning and mincing everything near them. Men, boats, everything were just one ghastly whirl. Captain Bartlett eventually realized what was going on and stopped the, the, the turning of the propellers. She sustained a head injury, but she survived. And the really remarkable thing about Violet Jessup is that she was a survivor not only of Britannic, she survived Titanic sinking, she also survived the, the collision that Olympic had. So she was on all three of the sisters and survived all three. And so a really remarkable, remarkable story. Although the deaths were brutal, um, there was about 30 people who died in the lifeboats. The vast majority of folks on board followed Captain Bartlett's orders and had a, a different experience. Um, he pictured here are some of the nurses who were on board. In the upper right-hand corner is Elizabeth Andouse, who was the matron, who was the matron on Britannic, so she was in charge of all of the nurses. And she had a very different experience. Uh, she told the newspapers, without alarm, we went on deck and awaited the launch of the boats. The whole staff behaved most splendidly, waiting calmly lined up on deck. The Germans, however, could not have chosen a better time for giving us the opportunity to save those on board, for we had all risen. We were near land and the sea was perfectly smooth. And I, I often think about that when I think about the beautiful smooth days at sea we had when we were out there, that we were, we were lucky too, um, to see the sea that smooth. Captain Bartlett was the last person to leave the ship. He sounded a prolonged blast of the whistle and stepped off the starboard bridge wing into the water and pulled himself into a collapsible lifeboat. The ship's reverend described the final moments of Britannic sinking. He said, gradually the waters licked up and up the decks, the furnaces belching forth volumes of smoke as if the great engines were in their last death agony. One by one, the monster funnels melted away as wax before a flame and crashed upon the decks. So the waters rushed down. Then report after report rang over the sea, telling of the explosions of the boilers. When the ship at last sank and there remained nothing but flat calm waters, he felt a sense of the desert overwhelmed his soul. The survivors were eventually picked up by destroyers that had come to their aid. And this is a photograph of the survivors on the destroyer. Um, some nurses, some sailors, um, all looking very happy and very relieved to be going back to shore. 
Uh, the wreck laid at the bottom of the Aegean Sea until 1976 when Jacques Cousteau, who's pictured here, along with Doc Edgerton, who um, was using some really advanced for the time side scan sonar, discovered the wreck. And they began diving the wreck in, in, in a series of dives in 1977. Um, since then, it has not been dived by very many. Um, part of that is because the Greek government has really preciously guarded access to the wreck, only recently opening it up to um, some more divers. Also because the wreck is deep. She's laying at 400 feet at the bottom of the Aegean Sea. So it takes a lot of technical diving skill to reach her. So today, Rick, you can change to the next slide. Today, she lies here. And this is a beautiful sight and it's making me very sad because a year ago today, we were on a little boat passing this lovely lighthouse. Um, this is the lighthouse that is outside, it's on Kia Island, Greece, and we would pass it every day going to the Britannic site. Today, you pass this little, you pass this little lighthouse and you go out, it's about a 20 minute drive on a boat, as uh, Scott said. She's lying here in 400 feet. She's still a 100 foot tall, 900 long behemoth laying on her side at the bottom of the Kia Channel. And she is remarkably intact. Those portholes that the nurses opened are visible. Her decks are still expansive. I remember Joe saying it was like landing on the moon when you land on that deck. And her giant propellers are still there, frozen in time. So now that you have a little more information about um, what she looked like back in her day and sort of the important elements of the ship as they pertain to the story of her sinking, I'm going to turn it over to Rake Ayrton to show you those stunning photographs of all of the stuff that you just saw above the water as it sits today underneath the water. Well, um, as well as enjoying deep technical diving, I'm also an underwater photographer. Uh, and I hope to explain uh, in a little bit of detail what equipment, what camera settings uh, I was using to record the Britannic expedition. I hope it isn't too nerdy for the non-photographers. Um, if it bores you, just look at the pictures. <laughs> so, um, moving on, this is a list of my photographic equipment that I took on the expedition. Prior to Britannic, I'd been using a crop sensor, very capable Nikon D500 uh, camera, but I realised that the housing that I was using was not rated deeper than 100 metres. Uh, one option was to get the housing upgraded, but I was actually getting a bit short of time. I was considering other options and looking at the new re released Nikon mirrorless cameras, the Z6 and the Z7, both the full frame, um, which gives a, a bigger sensor compared to the crop set frame camera. The Z6 is 24 megapixels and the Z7 was 46 megapixels. In fact, the lower pixel density of the uh, 24 megapixel Z6 contributes to its fantastic low light capabilities. And that was what uh, took me and, and I decided to go down that route. So I approached Alex Tattersall, um, the UK Nauticam agent, and he got me a 150 meter rated Z housing um, a few weeks before the trip. You also note that I'm using acrylic um, ports they are optically inferior to glass, but uh, the glass ports are only rated to 100 meters. Uh, and obviously I was going to be going somewhat deeper than that. The inexpensive video lights that I mentioned, um, believe it or not, come from Amazon and they retail at about 30 pounds or 40 US dollars. And surprisingly, they work fine at 116 meters on Britannic. Um, this section, I, I do, going to say that I'm not going to make any comparisons with any other cameras that I have no experience of. Um, so I will move on. This is my rig that I took um, to Britannic. In use, I'd be scootering along. I would stop. Um, I'd pull the scooter across my body. If you look at the, the picture bottom um, right, um, I'd swivel the camera. Uh, frame the shot and take it. Uh, the yellow diving swivel uh, was robust and worked really well. 
Normally, I use a 45 degree viewfinder, and I did take that on the first Britannic dive that, that I did. But unfortunately, I not really thought it through because it, it was only rated to 100 meters and it actually cracked on the dive, um, which meant that I had to take it out and, and go back to a, a simple viewfinder, which I couldn't use with a mask um, with, with the scooter being in the way. So I had to use live view um, on the Z6. And that was another benefit of changing to the Z system because the, uh, the shutter act activation on a Z6 is instantaneous. If I'd used the D500, there would have been significant shutter lag. Anyway, let's um, get that out of the way and we'll move on to Britannic images. I put uh, on these uh, pictures, I've put all the settings and things on the, uh, the left side of the, the, the shop. For the, so for those that, that just wanna look at that, that's where it is. And um, <clears throat> I think this, this particular image is the first Britannic image that I, that I took that actually shows the wreck in, in its glory. With the bridge cutaways, uh, and I'm gonna use my mouse here, I think hopefully you can see that, these bits here. I immediately knew where I was. Um, I was third pair in, uh, I was diving with Luke, and we arrived at the wreck just as Scott um, who is here, and George here, were starting their ascent. I had the camera set up in um, auto ISO, uh, which, which the reason for that is that at Britannic's depth, I didn't want to spend precious time messing about with lots of camera settings. So I had one of the Z6 custom menus set up as f5.6, 30th, of a second or a 40th of a second and auto ISO. The auto ISO would operate in a range of between 100 and 10,000. Uh, and most of the images I'm showing will be around these settings. Obviously on this particular image, the, the camera chose um, ISO 4000. When I was able to introduce light into the image, um, the auto ISO obviously coped with that as well. It, it changes here to 400 and you can see Luke um, scootering at the top rail of the wreck. Obviously I'm looking up into the sunlight uh, or the surface, uh, which also reduces the, the ISO. Many of the deeper shots I was taking, the ISO did end up as 10,000. A few years ago, it would have been unthinkable to be able to, to sort of show a decent image taken at ISO 10,000. I wouldn't take the D500 that far even now. I think this image shows it quite clearly. There's, there's good detail in the foreground. Um, I'll just point out a few things here. Uh, I just need to move that one over the other side. Uh, so we've got, we've got Scott here, he's got his um, video lights on. There are also lots of dark shadows and, and it sort of illustrates the fantastic dynamic range as well of the Z cameras. Um, here we can see the, the Gerda life davits behind him and here and here are two of the um, telegraphs. These are the engine room telegraphs, these are the, what the people on the bridge use to, to communicate with um, the, the engine room. Up here, this is something I actually only sort of realized was there when I saw this picture, but this is either an auxiliary helm or a compass binnacle um, lying on the, on, on the deck. This is the sort of midpoint of the, of the ship. Um, up here is the telemotor, which, um, which is which is where they would steer the the, the, sh the ship from. So I'm just gonna. What's happened? My. Okay, moving on. This is a, a closer shot of that telemotor, and um, the video light illumination drops the ISO to sixteen hundred. But the interesting features here 
are that this is the remains of the ship's wheel. So all that's left is the hub of the wheel and the rotted spokes. So you can imagine that on the day of the sinking, Captain Bartlett could well have been standing beside this, sort of ordering his minions around and telling them what to do. Uh, you can also note at the bottom of this, the ornate tiles. Uh, I've, got, I've got another image that shows the tiles in, in better detail. I, I, I wonder whether these are uh, ceramic tiles or linoleum tiles, um, but obviously we, we couldn't remove any to, 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 to have a look. <clears throat> uh, I just men mentioned in, in what I've written on the slide here, you can hear there's a fish here, there's, there's blur in the fish, um, because I'm using a 30th of a second, um, fish moving will, will appear blurred. This is possibly my favourite shot of the trip. Um, some of you will have seen it before because it's been on the flyers. This is the port anchor near the, near the point of the bow. And you can see the 116 metre seabed. Um, and Scott perfectly lined up using his video lights to illuminate the 15 tonne anchor and give it some scale. Again, despite a 10,000 ISO, a good bit of detail and not much noise is, is in, the, in the image. You know, for instance, you can see these small fish circling around, around the anchor, which, which you know, I think is, is amazing. A, a lot of the, the issues are not caused by problems with, with the camera, but, but the, the, the visibility that we had, which although good, you still can't see 50, 60 metres. Um, you can see 20, 30 quite easily uh, on Britannic. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just getting my notes. What I really wanted to do was to get the wide view of the wreck. And it's with shots like this that I did feel as though I had succeeded. Remember, it's nearly 30 metres or 100 feet from the top rail to the seabed. This is yet another 10,000 ISO image. Um, and I, th I think it, it does give scale to, uh, to, to the, this fantastic wreck that we, we were diving. I'm going to move now to the other end. Um, <clears throat> off to the stern. Scott here is securing the shot line for the rest of the team. And this was not an easy job at that depth. He's probably at about 85 metres uh, where the, the, the shot line dropped onto the, the wreck of Britannic. I'd gone in first with him on, on this particular dive. My job was to send a signal boy up when the job was done and also take pictures recording it. Uh, so I had the, the easy job, I think. Um, so this is the port propeller. This is the one that was responsible for the fatalities during the sinking when the lifeboats were pulled into it while it was still rotating. Yeah, I, I, I've put the, the, the statistics of that thing, weigh, weighs 38 tonnes. The, 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 this particular propeller was, was not a single casting, it was actually made in four parts. So there, so there was a central bit and the three blades were bolted onto the, 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 the central part of the, uh, the propeller. <clears throat> Given the, uh, the massive size of Britannic's stern, it was always going to be a challenge to get it all in. Uh, and as I previously stated, the seabed to top rail, or in this case, the top of the propeller, is approximately 30 metres or 100 feet. I had to be some way back from the rudder, in effect, to get the whole thing in. So this shot is limited by the visibility and the shoals of small fish which I couldn't do anything about. And, and again, I think it's a, a, another example of the capabilities of the, uh, the Z camera. Um, you might be wondering what this, this thing is here. Um, in fact, it's a, a snagged fishing net. Uh, obviously, the, the Greek fishermen go about their business and, and they probably all know now that the, the Britannic is where it is, but remember it was only discovered in, in 76 by Cousteau. Before then, 
fishermen would have would have trawled over over the wreck and potentially could lose their fishing gear which is obviously what's happened in this case it would be really good to get get it removed but in reality you're not going to uh, spend spend a dive trying to remove that um, it, it would be dangerous and and it would just take too long yeah I, I when i put this this slide in i wasn't quite sure who the diver is i think it's possibly uh, possibly joe um <clears throat> as soon as you get onto the upper side of the wreck there's considerably more ambient light and you can see that the iso has has dropped to 5000 here um i'm in fact lighting the um the, the central propeller this is the four bladed central propeller this this one was um a single casting which as you can see weighs 22 tons um the the olympic class vessels all had two engines two reciprocating engines that's the, the standard steam engines but um, they also had a turbine engine that was run off the low pressure exhaust from the two other engines and the the turbine ran this this central uh, propeller <clears throat> this is another of my favorite images it, it's the the diver is scott um and he's tiny but he just gives so much scale to the to the size of the wreck the um the massive lifeboat girders um or girder davits and and the whole thing has this sort of rather interesting halo of small fish which um are completely cover the wreck and there's, there's you know wreck divers don't go on about wildlife but th th this wreck was covered in wildlife the, the whole structure was covered in sponges and all sorts and uh, there were conger eels and and uh, lobsters and, and things like that all over it and uh, with the, with a food source like those fish you can understand why <clears throat> there's something about finding an everyday intact object on a shipwreck and this series of um, of shots show, shows just that coming across a bar, just, you know, just just fantastic to see something like that. Um, and um, I, I'm not sure the others. Have, I'm not sure anyone's seen this. I, I'd sort of kept these ones um, out of the public eye for some reason, and, and I came across them and decided they they've got to be seen. So. Um, Apparently, the this area is the forward officer's deck house, and we were on the deck, and, and there's this sort of little sort of bit where it's there's a there's a, a, a sort of entrance there, and you can just see it. Uh, but the bath is just sitting there, and um, what's fascinating about it is it it has double supply, so it has hot and cold in both fresh water and salt water. And if you, if you look at the right hand, the, sorry, the left hand image. It's got there are two plates now you can't see what each says but i suspect one says fresh and one says says fault salt uh, and i i'm just intrigued was that plug in when when the ship w went down and was somebody having a sh having a bath uh, at the time the the mine went off something we'll never know but you never know <clears throat> the, the interesting thing here is that the um the f-stop and the shutter speed remained exactly the same so all that changes is the the iso and it's all done automatically by the camera i didn't have to to change anything which makes my life really easy when you're when the decompression clock is ticking <clears throat> obviously we all spent far longer on uh, on the shot line and i have memory cards full of shot line images for me, I, I could while away decompression trying to get decent shots. And I probably annoyed various team members by trying to get, get in their face to get a, to get a decent shot. Um, in this particular view, we are all there. There are nine divers and then I'm behind the camera. So um, as, as I moved up into the shallows, I, I would 
then take control of the camera and change change the settings and and so here we've moved up to uh, f14 at a 200th obviously I'll, the camera remains on auto iso and is at 2500 i always like to take surface shots um, these ones were all taken with uh, the 8 to 15 lens that I was using all the way through, but this, these ones had a 1.4 teleconverter uh, behind the, the lens. So I could zoom into 21 millimeters, which I think works better for, this, for the surface shots. Uh, I would change settings just before surfacing. The small aperture, in fact, I think, I, I think actually I, I put these into, um, I might have put them into aperture priority actually to get these ones, but I, I wouldn't like to say that for certain because the ISO has changed. So I might have still left it as auto ISO. But anyway, I chose a very um, small aperture F29. And the reason for that is that I was trying to get split shots. I do have some split shots, but I've, I have to say I've not put any in here. You can see on this bottom right one, you can just about see a bit of Scott below water there. Um, but uh, I always think whether wherever I'm diving that having some surface shots really is good to show people who don't really understand diving too much what it's really all about. Um, the shot of Scott climbing the ladder is interesting because it's actually taken more or less directly into the sun. In fact, it's a little bit of a crop because the sun is a, is a fireball in, in the top corner. And so I, it's cropped down to, to get rid of that. Um, but it just shows the exceptional dynamic range of, of, of the Z6 camera. The next couple of shots I'm going to show are a bit different. So I took a drone uh, out with me and I did send, send it up and it, it's, it's only a, a spark, it's not, not a high-end drone, but I did get this shot. And, and again, I think this helps to give people uh, an idea of what we were doing. So if you look at this, this is our accommodation. So all 10 of us were able to stay in, in this one building, which was fantastic. And, it, and it, it just made the sort of community of us work so much better. This is the dive center. So we didn't have, we could walk down. It was, it was easy to, to get to the dive center. Um, the building site next door might well be a hotel now, I don't know but the, our dive boats were moored just, just along here and all the, the, the local Vukari um, restaurants were there as well, which, which was fantastic. And I, and I think sort of recording the trip, it's nice to see some topside shots as well. And then finally with my landscape photography hat, um, I, I took this. This was taken with my D500, which which went went along for the for the ride, uh, looking out on on the Kia Channel almost directly at the Britannic wreck site, which is probably somewhere around about here. Um, what would I do differently? Um, I wish I'd started using the Z6 camera sooner. Um, after the truck trip. I discovered better autofocus settings um, and underwater now I use for wide angle fairly static subjects which which is what wrecks fall into I use wide area autofocus uh, single shot with focus priority which means that the the shot has to be in focus for the shutter to operate the Z6 has had further firmware upgrades by Nikon which improves, has improved function even further um, than was available at the time of the expedition. Uh, and then finally, and funnily, I would probably push auto ISO even further, probably to 20,000. I've, I've been on some trips where I have pushed it to 20,000 and you get actually quite acceptable images at ISO 20,000. Last of all, I must thank O3 Dry Suits here in the UK. Um, they very kindly sponsored myself and a number of us on the expedition, and their support is really appreciated. Um, thank you for listening.
over to, to Jen. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was amazing. And there were some in there that, um, that I don't think I had seen before. We were I, yeah. It's beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Spectacular. Images, really. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to Rick Simon. Before I do, I did want to make one correction because I think I, sa I, I misspoke. I said uh, that they dis uh, uh, Cousteau discovered the wreck in 76. He actually discovered it in 75 and dove it for the first time in 76. So that was just a little correction. Um, Rick, do you, I'm going to turn it over to, to Rick Simon, who's going to introduce uh, the video that he's going to show. Yes. So right now I'm posting for everyone just quickly in the chat, a link to the video on YouTube in case it doesn't play well for you um, here. All right, guys. So the video is a combination of a bunch of our videos uh, with a nice, interesting surprise at the end. I think everyone knows what that is. So I'm just going to get straight into the video. Um, and, uh, let you guys see it. Let's see if this works. Jen, is it playing? It is. You click share, you hit share sound, right? Each time a wreck diver descends into the darkness and lays eyes on a shipwreck, he experiences a ghost-like connection to the past. The lure of sunken vessels is that when they plummet to the bottom of the ocean, their stories and their secrets go with them. Like the hulks of metal themselves, such secrets wait patiently for those who are curious enough to come along and discover them. Britannic, the largest ship of her day, sister to Titanic. A 100 foot tall and 900 foot long behemoth that has been resting on her starboard side at the bottom of the Aegean Sea for more than 100 years. Jacques Cousteau and Doc Edgerton discovered her in 1976. Since then, fewer than 100 divers have visited her, not only because access to the wreck is guarded by the Greek government, but because only the most experienced technical divers can reach her 400-foot depth. HMHS Britannic is the third vessel in White Star Line's Olympic class, a class that included Olympic and the famed Titanic. Britannic never knew the luxury of her sister because she was requisitioned by the British Royal Navy as a World War I hospital ship shortly after her launch in 1914. On November 20th, 1916, Britannic struck a mine laid by a German U-boat. The blast flooded six of Britannic's watertight compartments. It took her less than an hour to sink. In May of 2019, a team of divers set out to explore Britannic, 104 years after her sinking and more than 40 years since Cousteau first laid eyes on her. Among them were sea rovers Rick Simon, and Joe Mezrani. They went to marvel at this legendary wreck, to connect with her history, and to join the ranks of the few who have reached her. But they had their own mystery to solve. One born in 1976, before either Rick or Joe were born, Cousteau, Edgerton, and a team of divers from the Calypso made 68 dives to the wreck. Each time they surfaced, they brought with them priceless artifacts. If sea rovers are anything, they are secret hunters. Rick and Joe, wreck divers who cut their teeth in the waters of the North Atlantic, not only hunt secrets, they hunt treasure. It was only natural that the mystery they sought to solve involved artifacts. Whispers about artifacts taken from Britannic by Cousteau have echoed across generations of divers, with much speculation surrounding the ship's bell. The bell is the heart of a ship. It signals the watch, rings for ceremonies, and of course, sounds the alarm. The bell sounded when Britannic struck the mine and signaled to all on board that the ship would soon sink. 
It was likely the last man-made sound anyone heard before the sea swallowed her in a thunderous clap. Bells are the highest prize for shipwreck hunters, and this one, the bell of a ship that was not only the largest of its day, but Titanic's twin sister, would have been a crown jewel for an explorer like Cousteau. Some say Cousteau raised the bell and kept it in his private collection. Others say he took it to a museum in Athens or elsewhere in the world. Cousteau was silent on the subject. Cousteau's adventures mesmerized Rick and Joe as children. As adults who now discover and salvage shipwrecks, they often wonder if the rumors were true. Britannic's owner, Simon Mills, wondered too. He told the divers, when I die and go to heaven, the one question I want to ask Cousteau is, what did you do with Britannic's bell? Joe and Rick enjoyed five dives on Britannic in spectacular conditions, but they were still plagued by one question. Did Cousteau raise the ship's bell and hide it away? They spent their sixth and last dive trying to find out. Rick and Joe knew where the bell should be, right above the crow's nest, halfway up the main mast. The main mast is broken, but still attached to the ship with the topmost part resting in the sand, like a massive tree felled in a storm. The pair dropped into the water and first went to the bow. From there, they went straight towards the mast. The divers searched the area of the crow's nest, but the bell was nowhere to be found. As Rick ascended to photograph the ship from above, Joe remained at the crow's nest and descended, doing his best to draw a line from where the bell should have been to the sand below. In his final dive on Britannic, Joe cleared the name of Jacques Cousteau. The team spoke with Mills in the days that followed to tell him yet another Britannic mystery had been solved. Simon's response was simple. I guess when I get to heaven, I owe Jacques Cousteau an apology. Perfect. So I will turn it back over to uh, Joe and Jen. Jen, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. We do want to acknowledge there's credits there at the end, um, but we definitely cannot uh, let this opportunity to go by without thanking first Simon Mills, who was amazing. Uh, he was out there with the group um, answering questions. And, and I love that photograph of him with the little ship <laughs> because that is just the childlike wonder that he has about this wreck and his spirit of history and um, community around this shipwreck is really, really fantastic. Um, he w it was unfortunate that he couldn't be with us today. He had a, a personal engagement, but um, I, I, I did want to mention that because every time I see that picture, I just think about his enthusiasm for the wreck and it, it really is, uh, really was something to be able to spend time with him and to learn from him and so much that went into this particular presentation uh, especially the historical information came from Simon's work, research, and books on the subject. So um, 
And also we wanted to uh, thank, I wanted to thank Rick who has spent tireless hours editing this video and putting this video together. Uh, he did an amazing job. It was first debuted at Boston Sea Rovers and then he re-edited it again um, for, for this presentation and now this will be the version that sort of lives on YouTube. Um, and of course, you know, to everybody who's mentioned in, in the credits there, but I did want to give a shout out to Simon and Rick. Um, there are some questions. I know Scott has been answering questions in the chat, which is amazing. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions. It doesn't look like it. Um, I think Scott handled them. I think Scott was handling it like a boss. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> All right. Scott, do you have any last words? Not last words, but you know, for today. <laughs> <laughs> It was, um, you know, I, I can't explain to people just how, how amazing it was. I mean, I, I've been diving for um, 27, 28 years. Um, and, and this was, you know, just was, was two or three steps ahead of, of anything else that I've ever dived before. Um, it, it was, you know how when you're anticipating something so much and you turn up and you do it and it, it can turn out to be a little bit of a disappointment. I was almost slightly concerned that there was too much build up to, to going and diving Britannic and that, that I might just feel a little bit disappointed. Oh, no, no, no. It was absolutely mind blowingly amazing. Um, so look out, guys, because we've got more trips coming up. Hopefully, we're going to be doing um, Lusitania next summer, we hope, um, HMS Victoria um, the summer after. Uh, and hopefully I'm going to be out to see Joe, Jen and Rick this summer to, uh, to do the Andrea Doria, which I am really looking forward to. Thanks everybody for coming along. Really appreciate it. Is there any questions? Anybody? No? Okay. Cool. Thank you, everybody. What's, what's happening with the bell? Are they going to leave it there? Uh, uh, so the, um, at the moment, um, uh, Simon Mills has got a um, has got a project um, that he's trying to get past the the effort of marine antiquities in, in Greece. So it's it's a really weird situation with um, with Britannic. Um, so if it was a fully fledged uh, naval vessel, then it would still be owned by the government. Um, but it, it sort of falls in between with it, being a, with it being a hospital ship. So you have interested parties that are, the Royal Navy still has a, sort of loosely has an interest. Um, Simon's the owner of the wreck, but it's in Greek national waters. Um, and so you need a, an agreement between, uh, between all parties in order, to, in order to do anything, really. And we're not just talking about, about bringing things up. So... One of the projects that, that Simon's on, and it, it's a real shame that um, he wasn't able to make it to actually be able to tell you in more detail about it, but um, they, they are currently putting a, a big, big expedition on to go and start filming the interior of Britannic. Um, so we, something that our permit didn't allow us to do is to, is to go inside the wreck. Um, and, and this is not something, again, that Simon can just decide. So it's the, the, the effort of marine antiquities. So he's working with them as well as with um, uh, uh, film crews in order to, to put this, this, this massive project together to, to do um, some filming, some, some proper filming of the interior. But, but additionally, what they're looking at doing as well is, is trying to get license to, to bring some artifacts to the surface. So I think all the parties are... Um, are agreed that they would like to do that in principle um, but the question is um, where are those artifacts displayed so there's no question that they would go to a museum but is that going to be in uh, the UK is it going to be in Greece um, is anybody going to mention the Elgin marbles um, you know there's there's all these different factors um, going on but but the, the the really promising thing is that um, there are discussions um, about it and, um, you know, and ultimately, I think, you know, we, I, I sort of get the feeling that within the next five years or so, um, that there's, they're going to start bringing at least some of the artifacts up and those artifacts are going to go into museums so we can all, we can all go and have a look at them, which would be um, absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And I think the bell will be, will be part of that, will be one of those artifacts that's raised.
we'd really like, we would really like to be, I know Joe, would, Joe and Rick would really like to be the guys um, that, that go and um, go and lift it. And we've offered our services to put an expedition on to go and lift it, but um, we can only keep our fingers crossed. Wait, Yannis! 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 How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope that when this nightmare is over, uh, I'm pretty sure we need to, to do it again. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it's not all going to fail. <laughs> Definitely. I think I'm coming to live in Kia, Yannis. I'm going to come and live on Kia now, just, sure just and spend the rest of my life diving. <laughs> yeah, diving Britannic. <laughs> as long as we are we are healthy we move on huh? we go on that's yeah, it absolutely. and there's some also as scott mentioned some other beautiful you know you have the vertigala which is slightly shallower but even for people who are shallow divers like me there's some beautiful wrecks yes. uh, in kia and beautiful diving there and yanis at kia divers and his team there were just amazing guides to the island. So if anybody is thinking of visiting Kia and 400 or 200 feet is too deep, um, there is certainly stuff that you can see uh, at every, at every, every depth. depth, every depth. So definitely worthwhile checking it out, even if Britannic is a little out of your depth. 